right, good morning. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. We're talking community matters at this point with Randy Crable. Randy Crable is a reporter for the Tulsa World newspaper in Tulsa, and we know how he spent his weekend. Hi, Randy. Thank you for joining us on the show. Thank you very much for asking. Well, you wrote a piece that appeared in today's paper. I know you've written several pieces leading up to, um, you know, the Trump rally over the weekend, but you wrote a piece uh, which uh, it had a it had a, a, a dateline of 3 a.m. in the morning. So that means uh, you were up pretty late, I think, last night writing this piece, eh? Well, so maybe that was 3 a.m. your time. I wasn't up quite that late last night, but I was up pretty late Saturday night uh, uh -huh. uh, getting all the, all the stuff in. And, uh, you know, it has been a really busy week. Uh, in Tulsa, a week and a half or two weeks, um, just uh, a, a lot of attention uh, because of, uh, you know, a president coming to town to a place like Tulsa is always a big deal. Mm -hmm. And when you have the circumstances surrounding it, it, it became an even bigger deal. Yeah, well, you wrote, uh, you wrote an article with a headline, um... I know the headlines are not always the work of the reporter, but the headline reads, uh, uh, barring COVID-19 outbreak, which is an important thing we should discuss, Tulsa gets through potentially explosive weekend. So how did you see it as explosive going in? Yeah, well, people were very concerned here that the combination of uh, Trump, who's a controversial figure even here, restarting his campaign, uh, a lot of uh, emotion on both sides, plus the, the, the public health uh, concerns with COVID-19, um, some of the other things that have been going on uh, with uh, uh, protests over policing. Uh, we've had those here. We've had uh, questions about incidents involving policing here. Uh, now the demonstrations we've had here have been almost entirely peaceful and orderly, nobody's really gotten hurt or anything like that, unlike in other, some other places, but um, there was a lot of concern that it could get uh, pretty dangerous here pretty fast. Yeah, well, but, but somehow Tulsa escaped that. Uh, to what do you attribute the escape? Well, we're still trying to figure that out. Maybe they just don't like Tulsa, but... Um, <laughs> I mean, my sense is it's a combination of things. I mean, it, I think I think the campaign, the Trump campaign, oversold it from the beginning, and I think they kind of created some false expectations that actually might have kept people away. I mean, if you mm. think you have to fight, you know, eight hundred thousand people to get one of nineteen thousand seats, you may, may just decide it's not it's not worth it, and it's especially not worth it if you think you may get deathly ill. If you think you may be in the middle of a riot, um, you know, and there's a certain amount of expense involved and travel's not always that easy right now. So I think all of those things kind of came into, into play. That, but I also have to say that I think some of the local leaders were a factor, in, uh, not so much in the low turnout, but uh, for instance, the, the, the black leadership in the city uh, there were the, people were outraged when it was originally announced it was going to be on June 19th, which is Juneteenth, and has been celebrated in this city for decades. I mean, it's been kind of a big deal. And this year's celebration had actually been canceled because of COVID. So now the president, who's not all that popular with the, the black population, is going to defy all the uh, uh, public health directives and have his his, uh, his rally here and people were really upset. And I, I mean, I had people calling me who were almost in tears because they were afraid that uh, the, <laughs> that their part of town was gonna go up in flames and they didn't. Want so anyway, they really worked to c keep a lid on it. And they quickly organized a Juneteenth celebration. They encouraged all everybody to go there instead of to the Trump. Oh. Like, that was in the nearby neighborhood. Way. That was that was a, a distance away, and so it, it would draw yeah. people there instead of it at the uh, exactly. auditorium. Yeah. Exactly. And the way the rally was set up uh, made it more difficult to have uh, confrontations. They they uh, 
they blocked off about six square blocks in, in downtown where nobody could go unless you had a ticket or a credential. And you couldn't go in there and just kind of wander around. You had to go, excuse me, you had to go directly from the entry point to the arena. So there was no mingling up close to the arena of the various factions or even Trump supporters. In fact, there were Trump supporters who complained that they couldn't, um, you know, show their support outside, that the, or they could, but they had to be like two block, two or three blocks away. Good move. I think all of those factors kind of, and and you know, they they brought in a lot of um, head police from all over. They had National Guard there, and um, so you know, I think all of that factored into turning out to be a, a a pretty quiet weekend. So do you think uh, that's a really good good news uh, report? Um, because it had prospect of being explosive for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but do you think the, uh, the, 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 the waiver that the Trump campaign asked them to sign when they signed up uh, was, kept people away where they said they um, excused him from any liability right. if they caught the COVID? I don't, I, don't know if it, I don't know if it kept people away but I think I think COVID nineteen may have kept people away. I mean, <laughs> so here's the thing: is that there there in my experience, at least around here, there are a lot of people who are Trump supporters, or at least loyal Republicans who don't want to vote for a Democrat. Uh, but they also don't want to get COVID nineteen either either, and they you know they trust their doctors more than they do the politicians, and the doctors are telling them you can't do stuff like that. And so, you know, I think there, I don't know what the number is, but I think there were a lot of people who under other circumstances would have gone to a Trump rally who decided it wasn't worth the risk. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I know that kind of runs contrary to some of what he was saying and what his campaign was saying is that, no, it's fine. You know, you don't have to worry about COVID or, or whatever. I think it was a little contradictory what they what they were saying. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. But uh, well, there was some interesting uh, reports on how many people showed up. Um, yeah. I get. Um, I, I guess I got some of this out of your article. Um, the fire department counted sixty two hundred. Um, yeah. uh, the Trump organization counted ten thousand. And we, but you know we have concerns about their accuracy going way back to twenty seventeen. Um, and um, and then there was a story about how a million people signed up on the web, right. yeah, um, yeah. and then there was supposed to be a big crowd outside, but it didn't materialize. So the Trump Organization removed all the you know the the, the meeting paraphernalia uh, mm -hmm. from the outside of the auditorium, so it, did, it wouldn't be an embarrassment. Um, and and of course the uh, the TV shots showed the upper reaches of the auditorium right. pretty much right. empty. So this was probably, a, a, well, I know it was a disappointment to him. Uh, he was making sounds like he wanted to fire his campaign manager, which actually mm -hmm. he's threatened that before, a fellow named Brad Pascal. Well, you're nobody Pascal. if you haven't been fired by Donald Trump. Yeah, he, he's got 450 firings under his belt already. <laughs> it's an all time record. <laughs> it's better than The Apprentice, as a matter of fact. Uh, anyway, so did you go? Yeah, oh yeah, I was there, yeah, yeah, yeah. I. So on, on the matter of attendance, uh, we had a reporter there who's actually a sports writer. Uh, our sports writers aren't doing a whole lot right now. So she was assigned to cover it. She's covered a lot of events in there. And, and, and I know how much it seeds. We think it was about 10,000. That's where the 10,000 figure comes from. Fire mm -hmm. Marshall said 6,200. And I, I, I have to tell you, I really think there were more than 6,200 people in there. Um, the, uh, and then I saw something where the Trump campaign said there were 12,000 people went through the, the, uh, uh, the metal detectors. So I don't know, whatever it was, it wasn't what they expected. Yeah. What, what about the TikTok thing? Uh, yeah. where reputedly people, um, you know, uh, in a TikTok organization, whatever that is, uh, yeah, we're signing up on a. I'm not really going to go, but I'll just sign up in order to, you know, stuff the ballot box. But well, what, there was a there, there was an online effort, and I guess uh, the, now a, a, a woman on TikTok has gotten a lot of 
uh, notice for starting this, but I don't know much about TikTok either, other than it's just another social media platform. Uh, it, but but uh, which I guess appeals a lot to uh, fans of Korean pop music, and somehow they got involved. But there was an attempt to to uh, um, uh, turn in a lot of uh, false registrations. And I don't know if you looked at the registrations or not, but whenever they do these things, I think what a lot of people don't realize, the reason you register is so they, they can get your cell phone number and your email address. That, that's the whole point of doing that. And um, so when it started out, there were people who thought, well, we'll just, we'll just sign up and we'll get all 19,000 tickets and there won't be anybody there. Well, of course, they didn't cut off tickets at 19,000. They just kept taking all the names and, and, and I don't know if, if 800,000 or a million was accurate or if the campaign was getting overly enthusiastic. I will say whatever the, whatever the number was and, and the, and plus the publicity around it that was created by TikTok and this other, and these other things, I think it added to the idea that, okay, there's just, you know, an enormous number of people are going to be there and there's no point in us even trying. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it added to that. Mm. Uh, so the when, guy kind when, of when you were inside uh, watching, did you see uh, Trump's remarks? Did you see his, his speech, which was what, uh, a couple hours, I guess? It was, um, it was an hour and 42 minutes. And yes, yeah. I... I watched it all. How would you how would you characterize it? I mean, uh, he's often given speeches that are rambling, and they have mm -hmm. often included um, you know a lot of um, exaggerations and uh, insults. But how how would you characterize it? Well, it was uh, it was uh, interesting, I guess. Um, I mean, here's the thing about Trump in person: he can actually be pretty entertaining, telling stories and stuff. Uh, of course. You know, they're they're all about. I mean, they're all self-directed. You know, um, but the other thing about it is, is that he's the president of the United States. He's not he's not breaking in a stand-up routine for the club circuit. You know, so he <laughs> talks for fifteen minutes about you know why he might have looked shaky on that stage at West Point, um, and the whole point of the story was to you know. Um, uh, attack the credibility of the, of the press. Uh, I, you know, it just, it seems like, why are you, why are you doing that? That, it, you know, and, and I think most people either there or watching it uh, either didn't know what he was talking about or they'd already forgotten. You know, people didn't remember that incident. I don't think I understand why he gets frustrated sometimes, but, um, but I think he brings it pretty much on himself, but to well, get Pascal blame the press. Uh, he said the press was responsible uh, for the low attendance. Uh, sure, right. Well, the, the press, the Chinese, and, uh, and the uh, um, anarchists, the, the, the left-wing anarchists. And I mean, I think, you know, I th look, I think there's something to the idea that people didn't show up because they were worried about the flu in, in riots, but in the case of the flu, the press is only reporting what the healthcare experts are saying. And, um, and in the case of, you know, riots and stuff, they're only reporting uh, what's been going on in other cities. And, 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 and there were a lot of concerns here. I mean, early in the week, I mean, right up until, you know, the last people here were concerned that something could happen and it would get out of hand. I don't know if you know this, but there were a lot of businesses around town that boarded up their windows and just closed down because they were afraid of what was going to happen. So, you know, I, so I think that probably had an effect, but look, I mean, that's just, you know, I, 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 I think that's, I don't, I, look, in this country, people at the level of Donald Trump and his campaign, they know how the press works. So they ought to be able to know uh, how to deal with it. And either they do deal with it or they're intentionally, you know, setting stuff up so they can blame the press for it. 
Yeah, uh, you can tell that even from the four corners of what he said the uh, the other night, because he, he kept on referring to what he'd seen on television. That's where he gets his Yeah, that's kind of an interesting, and this is not an original, uh, but, uh, you know, one of the things he talked about the other night was how proud he was of the all the televisions on Air Force One. But at the same time, he's very critical of the, of the media and of television news, so. You know, you'd ask what I thought about the speech, um, and I wrote this, that, you know, the thing is, he actually raises valid points. I mean, uh, at times, you know, okay, why, you know, what, what about Joe Biden's record? And why haven't we seen him on the campaign trail? Those are all, there may be good answers for him, but those are legitimate questions to raise. The problem is, is that it all gets lost in the, you know, the noise that he creates with these, with, with some of these speeches, you know, talking about what did everybody fasten on? They fastened on him trying to be funny about, about coronavirus test. Instead I of, I didn't think that was so funny. Did, did you think that was a joke? It didn't sound like I, a joke. I, I did think he was, I did think he was, he was trying to be funny. Uh, but again, the problem is you're the president of the United States and whenever you say something, somebody's gonna take it seriously. Sure. And, and, and I, you, he had to know that that was gonna be one of the things that got pulled out and, and, and blown up. Well, he, might, he, he often goes for you know, consternation and trying to get everybody whipped up about something. And I wonder, you know, from the footage that I saw of, of his speech, that the crowd was really excited. Uh, what right. was your impression of the crowd? And oh, the crowd, the people who were, yeah, the people who were there were very excited. And, and, uh, and that's a pretty loud arena. Uh, most people probably outside of Tulsa don't realize it, but that's one of the number one arena concert venues in the country. And so it's got really good acoustics and really good um, sound. And it's, I mean, it, no, it wasn't full, but it, at times it sounded like it was full. I mean, the, the people were really, people who were there were really uh, signed on. Yeah, well, they were applauding nearly everything he said, and except yeah. when he talked about his, his uh, insults and enemies, uh, then they were making booing sounds. And they were right along with him as far as I could see. Right, say. right, no, yeah. absolutely. Were they uh, were they wearing masks? Were they like you really can't? Some distance. were, but not many. I mean, yeah. a lot of people with his campaign and and uh, with the White House were wearing masks. A few people in the crowd were wearing masks. You know, here I can't. I don't know about uh, worldwide or nationwide, but here a lot of people still don't understand that wearing a mask is not really to protect you so much as it is to protect everybody around you. So they take the attitude that, well, if I'm not wearing a mask, I'm not hurting anybody but myself. We have a question from a viewer, Randy. Uh, let's see. Did you have your temperature taken or were you offered a mask when, uh, when, you, when you covered this event? Was the press in general wearing masks? Uh, are you concerned right now about catching Corona that evening? Okay, so that's a very good question. Um, so the event was at seven o'clock in the evening. At eight o'clock in the morning, I had to be at the site to be have my temperature taken and have a COVID test, which I passed. And uh, I could spell COVID-19, so I passed. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, 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 they swabbed, they did a nasal swab and, and it came back negative. So I, I think that they tested every, or they took everybody's temperature. I didn't actually have to have it taken when I went in because I'd had it taken earlier. But everybody else who was just showing up at the arena, they had to have it taken there. Um, the, the press was almost all wearing masks. Now I wasn't offered masks because I had one. Um, and am I concerned? Well, so I'm on the list to get a COVID test. So I, I'm concerned enough that I'm gonna be tested again. Um, but I don't have any, I don't have any symptoms. And is it, I, I was more, I was more concerned before the event than I am now because 
uh, it was not nearly as crowded as I thought it would be. And they did, I think they took, tried to take measures to control it. Were they rejecting anybody? Um, I would have to say they did, but I, I don't know of anyone. And that, and that's a question. Were they, were they really taking temperatures? Or were they just waving a thing in front of your face and telling you you could go in? Yeah, really? <laughs> so what about, what about Tulsa? Uh, Tulsa had, uh, I mean, in the South, I don't know if you include Oklahoma in the South. Do we include Oklahoma in the South? Well, well Oklahoma is kind of an orphan. We, sometimes we're South, sometimes we're the Midwest, sometimes we're the West, it, well, we kind of float, and, and actually it depends on what part of Oklahoma you're in. Mm. Southeastern Oklahoma, that's definitely the South. If you're west of Oklahoma City, that's definitely the West or the Southwest. So. Interesting. Yeah, we, we were all in, uh, over the weekend, we were all singing from the Rogers and Hammerstein play. It's a catchy <laughs> tune. <laughs> yeah, right, right. right. Yeah, so that's, uh, our, that's our state song now. So. Oh, is that right? Well, it should be. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, what is the situation in general um, in Tulsa, in Oklahoma, on COVID? Uh, my last reading of it was that you had a spike. Yeah, that, and that's continued. Um, our mayor, uh, there was some tension between the mayors of Oklahoma City and Tulsa and a few smaller cities and the governor over shutting down, not shutting down. So Oklahoma City and Tulsa took some pretty drastic measures early on. And 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 our numbers have been pretty low until uh, probably two weeks ago. And, and since then, they've been going up. And uh, the number of cases has been uh, rising. Uh, the number of hospitalizations has been rising. I, I don't think the number of deaths is rising, but I think that's probably a little bit of a lagging statistic because you know for, you know first you get sick then you get hospitalized and then you either get well or you don't so um and i think it you know the the governor the governor pushed uh for stuff to start opening up at the end of may uh the mayor of tulsa was not keen on that uh, but he kind of got forced into a corner everybody else around it something along the lines of we've had two factories. We've actually had two factories close here. One of them makes school buses and the other one makes uh, appliances. And they've had to close because of COVID outbreaks in those plants. So that can, you know, that can cause a spike. Actually, one of the biggest sources of COVID in Oklahoma is a county out in the Oklahoma Panhandle, which is pretty sparsely populated. But uh, because it's sparsely populated, they have a big meat processing plant out there. And everybody in that meat pr processing plant got sick. Hmm. No surprise there. No. So uh, what about the, um, was it the mayor wanted to put a curfew on? And uh, yeah. the, judge, the judge rejected the curfew? Well, it wasn't a judge. The mayor here, uh, well, I say the mayor, the, the city, the police department was going to impose a 10 o'clock curfew on uh, the area around the the, uh, the uh, arena, and, and uh, apparently the president called him and said that that was unfair to his uh, followers, and so they lift. So the so the next thing we know, there's the police are putting out a press release that says the curfew has been lifted at the request of the Secret Service, and which seemed, I mean, I don't know anything about these things, but I was surprised that the Secret Service would want to lift the curfew. But anyway, so that's what happened with that. I, I'm not sure in the long run it made a whole lot of difference. One of the things that was going on, and I don't know if this is why they lifted it or what to deal with it, there were, there were a, a fair number, we had people who were showing up like uh, Monday or even Sunday, I'm talking about a week ago today or a week ago Sunday to get in line and they were camping out in front of the center. So these people were like camping out on the street and um, they had to move on Thursday because they put up this perimeter. But anyway, I think, you know, some of them may have been in danger of violating the curfew. Yeah. Oh, oh. You also had an issue with where, where, as I recall, two lawyers went to court 
um, oh, right, in, yes. in order to uh, uh, require social distancing, but they lost? What happened? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, there were a couple of lawyers that tried to get an injunction. Uh, and it was, uh, it was fast tracked to the state Supreme Court. And I have to admit, I didn't actually read the, the, uh, the opinion of the Supreme Court, but they said that there was, that, that they couldn't block it. So, I, I mean, I, I don't know how it is in Hawaii, but the state Supreme Court tries to be non-political, but there are some, some places that they're probably just not gonna, <laughs> it's just not gonna go. <laughs> I got you know, some more questions. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. Uh, one, one question is, uh, Trump looked completely demoralized and dejected. Now, do you think this will make him more dangerous or will he understand he only has six months, actually it's less than that, uh, left to salvage a legacy? Well, I mean, I don't know if they're talking about at the rally or if they're talking about that picture or that video of him getting off the, the helicopter in the wee hours of the morning in uh, in Washington. Yeah, you know, most of us don't look that great coming home at two o'clock. <laughs> no. But anyway, he did. He did look very uh, dejected. And, you know, that's that's hard to say. He uh, he he say what you will. He tends to be somebody who. who puts up a fight. Uh, I mean, I, I would say that he's thinking and a lot of other people are thinking we got to do something different. Now what that something is, I don't know, but uh, I would, you know, so we got to do something different and who knows what that something different is. Yeah, I agree with you. Here's one other question. Were people who came to the event staying in town before and after, uh, were they from out of state? Were people uh, in public areas? Were, oh yeah, were people out in public areas in Tulsa, uh, like in restaurants? That's a multiple question, but uh, yeah, yeah. can so, you handle it? Yeah, well, I'll do my best. I don't know if I have a great answer. I don't, I don't know. I don't think anybody knows the exact, I guess you would say geographical mix of people. We know that, as I was saying earlier, we talked to a, a person from uh, Massachusetts and one from San Diego. So, so, so there was some kind of a, a mix there. Uh, there were people who I know drove in from uh, Louisiana and other places like that. Um, and apparently the hotels were pretty busy and they were very excited about that. I can tell you. Uh, and, and they would have been in restaurants and um, so, yeah, I mean, that, and that was one of the big concerns uh, about the whole event was we know we're going to have some number of people coming in and then we're going to have some number of people leaving. So, you know, some people called it a, said it had the potential to be a super spreader. Um, so, so yeah, yeah, I, I know that's not a great answer, but that's the best I can do you, tell you is that, uh, there is concern about that. Randy, I want to do one other thing before we close, and let's go through the, the photographs that appeared with your article. I guess it was this morning or yesterday in the Tulsa mm -hmm. World. So let's go through them, and can you tell us what each one depicts, okay? I'll do my best. Okay, there's one. Yeah, well, that's Donald Trump uh, standing on the podium at the Bank of Oklahoma Center. Uh, that is a uh, person, that's a protester, an anti-Trump protester. And uh, she's down, that building in the background is part of the Tulsa County Courthouse. And uh, so that, those people were kind of marching around. So this was a thing I kind of got in a little bit of trouble in. Uh, so the, uh, the person on the extreme left is the chief of the Sac and Fox Nation in, in Oklahoma. The guy next to him with the glasses on is G.T. Bynum. He's the mayor of Tulsa. And then you have the lieutenant governor behind Trump. You can't see him as, as uh, Senator James Lankford. Uh, Senator Lankford's wife is in the red dress. And then that's Senator uh, Jim Inhofe standing next to her. So Trump had come down off the Air Force One. And it appeared that he had shaken hands with the first couple of people in line. 
And then when he got to got to uh, the mayor, he he just he gave him that. You can see in the picture, he's just kind of a raised fist salute or something. And I I thought he had snubbed the president. I was I mean he, that that the president had snubbed the mayor. Uh, but on reflection, I'm not so sure. I don't think he actually did shake hands with the earlier per people. What I thought was him putting his hand out to shake was actually him putting his hand in front of his body and, and holding it. You know, he's, he, he, he doesn't really like to shake hands. And so I don't know. Anyway, that, that was him getting off of Air Force One in Tulsa. And that was the official receiving line. Okay. What else we got? So this was before I got there, and uh, I believe that is, um, I believe that's Eric Trump, and then Laura Trump, who is his wife, and they spoke. Before Trump spoke, they had a long list of uh, surrogates who got up and talked. And, and, and one of the things that was kind of, to me, odd about this is that he had about 10 members of Congress there from all over the country that were supposed to be you know, benefiting from this. I, I noticed that uh, uh, Stefanik from New York said that she got about $150,000 for her campaign by going on that trip. So I don't, I don't know. But anyway, uh, anyway, that, it's, that those folks and they, and they were speaking. So that was, that was the Trump children. Uh, okay. And, and, and Pence spoke, didn't he? Pence spoke, I guess. Uh... Pence spoke. There was actually, uh, so one of the sort of side issues that developed during the week was that, you know, the, 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 the uh, African-American community was not pleased about them having it on Juneteenth. So they, so they backed off of that. Then the governor, without consulting anybody, said, well, well I'm going to try and talk Donald Trump into visiting Greenwood. In other words, the black, black neighborhood. Well, that caused some heads to explode and they said we, we don't want him here and we're afraid that people will you know go crazy if you do so they backed off of that so what they settled on was uh vice president pence coming in a couple of hours earlier and meeting with uh some black people um and and so he was there early and then he he came and he he was like the warm-up act like i don't know what they call it but kind of the he, he led into to president trump did he go to Greenwood? No, he didn't. He went to a, an area uh, that's uh, predominantly black and at a church uh, that's called the Dream Center, and uh, met with some. Uh, he met with some black folks um, who who were who are not the ones who have a problem with Donald Trump. Mm. Okay. Or at least got, not a serious enough one to avoid, you know. Yeah, might, talk. might have an incident. Yeah, yeah. So, got any more photos? Right. Okay. So on the uh, the fellow on the extreme left in the second row, that's uh, Representative Kevin Hearn, who represents Tulsa in Congress. And then in front of him, uh, the guy with the blue face mask on, that's Representative Frank Lucas. Uh, so these these are congressional people, uh, and then in the red dress again, that's Cindy Langford. That's uh, uh, Senator Langford's wife. And then next to her is Senator Langford with red hair. Uh, this fellow right here is uh, Lieutenant Governor Matt Pinnell, and not many people know him, but he actually had a pretty big role in getting Trump elected. He was in 2016. Uh, he was uh, with the RNC and was in charge of the state campaigns. And as some people might remember, Trump did not have a very uh, well-organized campaign. So it was up to Matt Pinnell and some other people with the RNC to get, you know, get people mobilized in places like uh, Michigan and, and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and North Carolina, those states that they won that made the difference in the election. It, now, his reward for that was that he lost his job. So. <laughs> okay, we got. I, I don't know that he wasn't. He wasn't exactly fired, but he he thought he might become the RNC chairman, and instead they they uh, named uh, uh, Mitt Romney's sister, so he he resigned and came home. And now he's been a governor of Oklahoma. Small world. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think I think that's it. Are there more pictures? If not.
Uh, there we go. <laughs> Okay, so this is, yeah, this was down uh, on the area that I mentioned there were a couple of blocks where, uh, you know, people would come into, you know, uh, contact with law enforcement and diff different sides. And uh, I don't know exactly what this incident is, but, uh, but that's, that's what's going on there. That's in downtown Tulsa. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that's uh, obviously the plane. When he, when he uh, came in on uh, Saturday, he had him fly over downtown Tulsa, uh, even though that's not the route they would take to land at the airport, but he wanted to fly over so they could. And as I pointed out, uh, that they, um, one of the things that would have stood out the most to him was a big, uh, uh, in big letters painted on Greenwood Avenue, which is on the near, which is downtown, was Black Lives Matter. So uh, that might have been a harbinger of what was to come. I don't know. <laughs> Randy, it's great to talk to you. It's great to have this conversation. I wish we had more time. Um, thanks for thanks go for having me. Next show. Randy Crable of uh, the Tulsa World newspaper in Tulsa. There's so much more we could discuss. And I hope we have the opportunity. Thank Me you, too. Randy. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Stay safe. Aloha.